The letter of the Ephesians is Spiritual Champions League. To play in the Champions League, you have to be in top, top all-star shape. So how can I be spiritually in all-star form? Well, it means to be in close connection to God, listening to Him and having fellowship with Him. But that's only possible if you have separated yourself from evil things, just like the Ephesians. They threw all their worldly scrap and rubbish in a public pile and burned them. Perhaps we too should firstly tidy up our disarray or we won't understand any of the deep thoughts that the Holy Spirit wants to share with us through this letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians is a typical Pauline letter, which means that it is divided into two parts. Paul often starts his letters with the spiritual part, ending off with the practical part. And this structure actually makes a lot of sense. For example, when a new game is learned, we start with the rules of the game before we actually play. And that's the way it is here. First the idea, the line of thought is explained, and then the theory can be applied and practiced. That our deeds and actions originate from our world of thoughts could also be explained by the spiritual principle, the heavens rule the earth. Spiritual principles have a direct influence on what is happening on earth. So the first part goes from chapters 1 to 3, while the second part goes from chapter 4 to chapter 6. The first part can be summarized with the words chosen in him, so what we are, identity, we're chosen. And the second part can be summarized with the words live according to your calling, that what we should do. In short, you were made into this and that, now also act like this. Practice what you already are spiritually. Now, what is the first part about? When we look at the text, we will notice one word repeated again and again. The mystery. Paul is revealing a mystery here. Having a secret and a mystery implies that something is not known. And consequently, that there was a time of not knowing. So, there are two time periods. A period in which this mystery was not yet known, the time before Paul. And a second period in which this mystery was revealed. It is also called the dispensation or the plan of the fullness of times in chapter 1 verse 10. Hmm, interesting. Let's just leave it as is for now. If we take a further look, we will find another important distinction, but this time between two groups of people. One entity called Israel and another group called Ecclesia. Israel is clear, the privileged Old Testament nation that God had chosen. But what is this Ecclesia? Ekklesia is a Greek word which consists of two words, ekklesia. Ek is related to the Latin word ex, which means out, and klesia comes from the word kaleo, which means to call. So simply put, ekklesia means called out. What this exactly means we don't understand yet, but let's keep digging. There's a lot of talk here about heavenly things. These are placed in contrast to the earthly. Another point is that this Ecclesia was chosen before the foundation of the world. And if you know a little of the Old and New Testaments, you can join some puzzle pieces together. Israel was chosen from the foundation of the world. Israel was given the land. All blessings for Israel were earthly. To have a good harvest, to have a beautiful family, to have no diseases and peace in the land. All promises related to what goes on on this earth. But Israel turned away from God and disobeyed to all his messengers, killed the Messiah, the king, and even stoned the last witness, Stephen. So God closed the door for Israel for 2000 years, or two days, just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. During this time, God has turned to another people, another bride, to make Israel, his earthly bride, jealous. But this new ecclesia is a nation which isn't a nation. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Wait, Paul? Interesting, actually. When we think about the stoning of Stephen, it was Paul who was on center stage there. You see, the door of Israel closed at this very bloody event. Yet God chose one of the acting criminals from there and transformed him into a, or better, the main preacher of the new mystery. This is God's grace. This new mystery implies that God has turned to a new group of people he calls the Ecclesia his body and even his bride. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, Jesus had said to Paul when he appeared to him on the way to Damascus. With this, he wanted to say, by persecuting what you believe to be a new sect, the Christians, you are persecuting me. I, the head, am in heaven, and they are my body, and I love them like my bride. 
So God has a nation which is not a nation, on earth though it is not earthly. Wow, who are these people? They are a nation which is not defined by a relationship with a common ancestor, neither by nationality, a relationship with a country or defined ideals, but a single and unique characteristic, in Christ. You see it everywhere in the text, all those who are in Christ belong to it, and this only by grace and through faith. This means that if you believe in Jesus Christ and entrust your life to Him, you can enter today into the blessings that far exceeds the Garden of Eden and the blessing and promises of Israel. You are added to the body of the Lord Jesus and He sees you as a part of His bride. For an Israelite, this would have been a mega revelation. But how much more is it for us, you and I, who are just normal and average heathens? What a grace to be able to share these promises. The Apostle falls into worship as he writes about it. Maybe you too should read the passages once more and open your heart in prayer afterwards. Before we close, however, let me give you another example. In the book of Genesis, where we already find a picture of this. It's Joseph in Egypt. He's rejected by his brothers, just like Jesus is rejected today by his people Israel. Joseph occupied himself with the world, the nations, and saved them, just like Jesus Christ became the savior of the world. But Israel as a national entity will also be saved, and we see this type in Genesis as well with his brother coming back. But who stood by Joseph's side as he reigned over Egypt, which is an image of the world? An Israeli woman? No, that's the clue. Asniat, a heathen woman. See, this is you and me, when we have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. While Israel still rejects him, we can stand by his side in this world and soon from heaven, where Jesus Christ currently abides, reign with him in glory over heaven and earth. And that is amazing. So this was already the second video of this three-part series. Thank you so much for watching till the end. And if you want to stay in the loop, uh, just subscribe here or leave us a comment in the comment section. Thank you so much for your prayers and sticking with us. I would say we'll see each other in the next video.